Hello and welcome to Legacy Television. I'm Jeremy Pearsons. So glad to have you tuned into this broadcast today. I'm coming to you from the sanctuary here at Legacy Church in Green Mountain Falls, Colorado, where our good God has done good things. He's doing great things and greater things are yet to come. You may be watching this today going, why do they call everything Legacy? You know, you got Legacy TV and Legacy Church. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that. You know, for us, legacy is more than a word. It's more than an idea. It is the motivating factor and the motivating force behind our ministry and everything we do in this ministry. Let me read something to you from the book of Psalms. Psalm 145 verse four says this, one generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. One generation shall declare your works to another one. That to us, is legacy. See, we believe that every generation serves as a bridge, a bridge between the one that's gone before them and the generation that's coming after them. And we have it so big in our hearts to serve our generation. And that's what the Bible says in the book of Acts about King David. It says he served his generation by the will of God. And that's our assignment to serve our generation and to take what the generations before us have given to us, revelation from the word, how to live and walk and talk and fight by faith, and how to give that to the generation that's coming after us. That's what legacy is all about. We are a bridge from the generation before us to the one that's coming after us. And I'm so thankful today to stand here before you and tell you that we've got partners. The Lord has added precious people to us from all over the world and people uh, not just of my generation, but those uh, uh, of my parents' age and grandparents' age. And that says something to me. That says something to my wife, Sarah and I. And what it says is that that generation is sowing into the next one. They don't wanna see revelation. Uh, stop with them. They don't want to see things that change their life end with their life. They want their kids to get it. They want their grandkids to get it. That's what legacy is all about. So in just a moment, you and I are going to get into the Word of God together. But before we do, let me give you an opportunity today. If you're not yet a partner with this ministry, go before the Lord and find out if He has an assignment for you in this, if He has a legacy assignment for you in this ministry. If you are interested in seeing another generation served with the Word of God, then there may be a place for you in partnering with this ministry. There's information right now on your screen about how you can do that. You can use the address that you see, or you can visit us online at pearsonsministries.com. There you can find more information about partnership. You can find ways to give there. Uh, if you're watching inside the United States and you'd like to give an offering today via text message, you can do that by simply texting LTV and any dollar amount to the number 28950. And keep this in your heart and mind today. It is a legacy offering. You are sowing into the next generation, making sure the same word of God that has changed your life gets into their lives and does the same thing for them that it did for you. Amen. Thanks so much for giving today. We call you blessed in Jesus name. Now let's take a few minutes. Let's get into the word of God together and I'll be back at the end of this broadcast. Go to the book of Romans with me. Romans chapter eight. If we are gonna be kept safe, when a thousand are fallen at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, then we're gonna to have to have some kind of advantage that the rest of this world doesn't. We're gonna to have to have something that they don't have. We need information they don't have. And you see this here in the book of Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, and we're going to look at several verses here. But I want you to keep your eye out for something. Two words. I want you to keep your eye out for the words spirit and the word flesh. So what words are you looking for? Spirit and flesh. Now, every time as we read these, through these verses, when you see either the word spirit or the word flesh, I want you to say it out loud as I read. So let's start here in verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. 
on account of sin. He condemned sin in the that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit. but the Spirit. the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore... Brethren, we are debtors not to the, to live according to the, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now look at verse 15 and see what this is so closely connected to. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You've got flesh, you've got spirit. And in these 15, 16 verses, how many times did you see these two words over and over and over again? The flesh and the spirit. The flesh and the spirit. He's talking about the difference between living by the flesh and living by the spirit. He gets to verse 14 and he sums it up like this. He says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God... These are the sons of God. Being led by the Spirit is a defining characteristic of a child of God. Being led by the Spirit, that has to do with the decisions that you make in life, the directions that you take, the moves that you make. You can be led everywhere you go in everything you do by the Spirit. Now, how many of you know this is not happening all over the world right now? Most, much of the rest of the world is not even aware of the Spirit, not aware of the Spirit realm. The unborn again person lives completely in the flesh. That means they live completely in this outward physical realm. And every decision they make is based strictly on what they see. It's based on what they feel. It's based on nothing but outward circumstance. And this is how the vast majority of the world lives life. The moves they make, the directions they take in life are based strictly on what they see. And this is how you identify the difference between flesh and spirit. When you think or when you see this word flesh, you need to think outward. When you see the word spirit, you need to think inward. And that's the difference. Being led by the flesh, living in and by the flesh, is just simply living by what you see, by what you feel. And every decision is made based on something outward. Now, when it comes to the world living like that, I get it. What else are they going to do? Huh? 
You don't even believe, many of them don't even believe there's a God, much less a Holy Spirit that can fill you up, much less one that will lead you in your directions, and that a God you can actually talk to and who will talk back to you, one you can ask direction for and he'll give it to you, a Holy Spirit that will lead you and guide you and direct you and correct you. They're not aware of any of this. So what else do they have to make decisions based on? Nothing. It's all flesh. And when it comes to an unbelieving world living like that, living like that, I get it. But when it comes to the church, when it comes to born again people, living life, making decisions based on flesh stuff, I'm sorry, I don't get it. Because we've been given, for lack of a better word, an unfair advantage over the rest of this world. We do not have to live our lives based strictly on what we see, based only on what we feel. We've got something else. We've got someone else on the inside. We don't have to live just based on what's on the outside. We've got something going on on the inside. And if we're going to live in this crazy messed up world with some crazy messed up people in it, and we're going to live hiding in plain sight, then we're going to have to live based on some inside information. There's someone in us who can tell us something about the future that the rest of this world doesn't know. You can wake up every single day and know something about the way the day's going to go that the rest of this unbelieving world doesn't know because you've got inside information. Information that comes not from the outside. Information that you don't get watching Fox News, CNN. Information you don't get scrolling through social media. Information that comes from the inside of you. Where the Spirit of God lives big on the inside of you. So unbelieving world, best of luck. Born again, Spirit-filled believer, you got a higher way of living. You got a better way of living. You've got greater information. Greater is he who's in you than he that's in the world. And that's what this entire passage is all about. Now, if you don't think this is serious, then go back and listen to what he said. He said in verse 6, Romans 8, 6, to be carnally, that just means flesh, to be flesh-minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Verse 13, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Okay, does it get more plain? Does it get more plain than that? If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will die live. In case you're wondering if it really makes that much difference if you just live by the flesh or live by the spirit, you want to know what kind of difference it is? Life and death. It's literally a life and death decision. When you are deciding the major direction for your life or the daily direction for your life, flesh leads to death. Spirit leads to life. He said in verse 15, I read this to you, but you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. One of the most important things in this life, in the life of the believer, is to learn how to be led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. And where is the Spirit? Out here somewhere? No, inside. Inside information. Learning to be led by the Spirit means you refuse to be led by anything else. And there's a lot of things that I think even church people make decisions based on and assume it's God. They get an offer for a job and, well, you know, it's a lot more money. That must be God. It's more money. It must be God. Being led by money is not being led by the Spirit. Yes, but it's a really wonderful opportunity. And I just pray all the time, God, if this is you, open the door. If it's not, close it. Being led by that is not being led by the Spirit. You're asking God to do something outwardly, physically, naturally, visibly, when He's wanting to lead you based on the inside. 
not based on anything outside. And a lot of people, oh, the door's open. It must be God. Huh. Just because a door is open does not mean it's God. And just because a door is closed doesn't mean it's not him. So you're going to have to have information that everybody else doesn't have. An open door. Well, if you make a decision based on an open door, what's the difference between you and Joe Sinner? Who doesn't even believe there is a God? That's how he makes his decisions. Open door. Looks good. More money. But how many believers hmm, have been offered more money and so they left a church family. They left a place where the Lord had assigned them, had planted them. Oh, it must be. It's got to be him because of all these natural things, of all these physical outward things. Mm -mm. The rest of this world lives and makes decisions and goes places and puts their children in a school here or takes a job there based on reasoning, right? Well, they've done the research. They've looked, and in this community, this place, this community is one of the safest in the nation. How do you know that? Well, you know, Google. Oh, Google told you. So people are living Google-led. Am I telling the truth? Are people living lives Google-led? Are people buying cars Google-led? Are people buying homes Google it. They are. It's happening all the time. Again, rest of this world, I get it. That's all you got. Church, we got something else. We've got inside information. We've got information the rest of this world doesn't have. And to, be, and to just make a decision based on research that you did, based on statistics, demographics, and to rule out the leadership of the Holy Spirit. To get yourself in trouble. I said we can really get ourselves in trouble. Being led by something other than the Spirit of God in us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, turn there with me. I love this whole chapter when you read it, and we've talked about it in here before, but the word you see come up over and over and over again is this little word, we, W-E, we. And he's talking about the difference between us, just like we are today, between us and the rest of this world. And he says things in here like, uh, we, in verse 7, have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are hard-pressed, but we're not crushed. We are per perplexed, not despair. We are persecuted, not forsaken. He says, we um, have this, verse 13, the same spirit of faith. We believe, therefore we speak. This is describing a person of faith, living by faith and the difference between them and the rest of this world. But he gets down into verse 16, and he says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Now, that right there is different from the rest of this world. We, as people of faith, he goes on in chapter 5 to say, we walk by faith and not by sight. Everybody else who's walking by sight, the result is they lose heart. They're giving up. They're quitting. But we do not lose heart, he said, even though, listen, our outward man is perishing. Now that right now, that right there is enough to depress most people. That is enough to make most people lose heart completely. What? The outward man is perishing. That's why it is a multi, multi, bu, 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 billion dollar industry. What? The diet industry, the exercise industry, the, the plastic surgery, the nipping this and tucking that industry. Why? People are endeavoring to preserve the outward man. And, and I'm not knocking any of it. Do what you want to do. As long as you know this outward man, no matter what you do to it, it's on its way out like as we speak. It's perishing. The outward man, what's on the outside is perishing. And he says, we, here's what's different about us and the rest of this world. We don't lose heart because of that. 
We're not messed up. We're not depressed just because we look in the mirror and the guy looking back is not the same 20-year-old that used to be looking back. We don't get depressed because the lady in the mirror doesn't look like the one that was there, it seems like, just a few minutes ago. We're not depressed over the outward man. That's not us. Why? How can you keep from being depressed over the outward man? The inward man is being renewed day by day. See, there again, the rest of this world doesn't even know there's an inward man. We do. And this is where we get our information. From the outward man? No, the inward man. Man, I, I really like this. I, I have wanted to do this for years now, to develop these two superhero characters for our children's ministry. You've got the adventures of outward man <laughs> and inward man. And these, these little adventures that they go on together, and you can imagine, outward man uh, never gets it right. But inward man is always there. He's always strong. He always knows what to do. Outward man and inward man. We've all got both. We're not depressed over the outward man because we're excited about the inward man. He's being renewed day by day. Verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What are you looking at? Because this world that is not filled with the Holy Ghost doesn't celebrate Pentecost Sunday. All they have to look at is what's on the outside. But church, you and I got something else. We, he said, in this house of faith, those who walk by faith and not by sight, we do not look. That means we do not, we do not focus on what's on the outside. I don't look to the outside to help me make my decision. I don't look to the outside to decide for me where my kids go to school. I don't look to the outside to, to help me decide where I get a job. I don't look to the outside. Where am I supposed to be looking? Inside. We're supposed to be looking inside at the things which are not seen. And we know this because this is where God looks. He does not look on the outward appearance. He's, he does not see the way man sees. He looks on the heart. He looks to what's unseen. Well, if God is looking to the unseen, where should we be looking? Exactly where he's looking, to the unseen. This is how we hide ourselves in plain sight. We, we don't look to the outside to tell us where the safest place is. We get led by the Spirit. We look for inside information to the unseen. Now, I'm going to show this to you in Scripture, then I'm going to tell you a couple of stories about how we've seen this take place in our life. In Acts chapter 27, I want to show you what it looks like to live based on inside information and what it looks like to ignore it. Acts chapter 27 Thank you, Lord. I'm going to read this whole account to you here. It's several verses. You're probably familiar with it, but listen to it. Listen again. Acts chapter 27, verse 1. It says, When it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners, so Paul's a prisoner at this point, to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Adramantium, we put to sea, meaning to sail a, along the coast of Asia. Um, Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. Verse 3, the next day we landed at Sidon. Julius treated Paul kindly, gave him liberty to go to his friends, receive care. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So there was something working against them. When we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly, somebody say slowly. We had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Sal uh, Salmone. Sorry, I should have practiced all these words. Passing it with difficulty, 
we came to a place called Fair Havens near, near the city of Lassie. Verse 9, now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them saying, men, I had a vision. Is that what he said? Men, I've got a word from God. Thus saith the Lord. No, what do he say? Men, I perceive... I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. What is that? That's inside information. But I want you to notice the word he used. It's a perception. A perception is not a vision in the night. It's not a voice out of heaven. It's not some big, spectacular display. What is a perception? If you look it up, it literally just means I, this is what I see. But I don't see it outwardly, I see it inwardly. And so much of the time, the leading of the Holy Spirit comes to us not in some big display, not with fireworks in the night, not with a big, booming voice, not with a prophet standing at the foot of your bed saying, thus saith the Lord, don't take that job. It's a perception. It's a knowing on the inside. Anybody ever said this before? I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew I should not have gone there. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. How? How'd you know that? It's a perception on the inside. And what people don't realize is that they're getting inside information and they're ignoring it. They're overriding it. Before we leave this broadcast today, Sarah and I want to invite you to take some time and write down what the Lord's doing in your life, especially those of you who are partners with us in this ministry and we've been connected, hearts connected for a long time. If the Lord's done something for you through this ministry, we wanna hear about it. We call those glory stories. We call those testimonies of the good things our good God has done in your life and we want you to write it and we wanna share it with other people. Yeah, what if we spent all our time thanking God for things that he had done for us and things that he had done for the people that we love. And that's what we spend our time here yeah. doing. We take uh, every Sunday, we take time to just give God glory for every good thing that's going on. And we don't want to even forget the smallest of that's details. Right. We yeah. want to remember, like the psalmist said, remember uh, all of his benefits. Remember how he's healed us. Remember how he's provided for that's us. Right. Remember how he's taking good care of our babies and our families. He is such a good and faithful father. Father. That's right. Amen. So listen, if the Lord's done something good for you and you just want to tell about it, you need to. Use the information that you see right now on the bottom of your screen. Email us. Send your testimony, your glory story to glorystory at legacychurch.family. Let us shout with you. Let us rejoice with you and let what God has done in your life stir some faith in somebody else because when they see how good he's been to you, they'll see how good he can be to them. Amen. Thanks for joining us today on the broadcast. We'll see you next time on Legacy TV.